often say that I don't write poetry, it just finds its way on the page. Half the time, it's in the middle of the night, and I will wake up, there'll be a poem in my mind, or a word, or a phrase, and I will rush to get a piece of paper, and I'll start writing, and sometimes my husband will look up, oh, it's a poem, and he'll pull the covers over his head and go. And I just, it's almost as if it's, it's full born. I, well, the words come out, and there's very little that I change afterwards, as if it comes from some deep place of understanding, of, of another kind of awareness. I, it's not as if I ever sit down and say, oh, I'm going to write a poem about mourning, or about the sunrise, or about friendship. Something will happen, and I'll be in that experience, and the next thing that I know, the words are coming. What took you to publishing your work? What was the process that allowed you to put your work out into the world? Well, the way it began, it began oh, 10 years ago. I was studying to be a coach, and I was going through a program at Coach U, which happened on the phone, so we didn't get to meet any other coaches. So what a group of us, who were all women, all over the age of 50, decided to create something called the 50 plus SIG. So we were all women going back into coaching at that age. On the first call I was on, we were talking and something prompted me to pull out from the shoebox a poem and read it. And these women said, where can I get that? Where's the book? There's no book, there's a shoebox. They encouraged me to publish that first book called Soul Notes. So that was the beginning of it. It took a tremendous amount of courage to put myself out there that way. Why so? Because poetry is very intimate. It's very immediate. There's not, I don't hide behind anything. Eventually, the, I wrote Soul Notes too, and then when I wrote Write, which is all sensual, sexual poetry, that really took courage to put out in the world. And the only way I did that is the same woman who was the artist who created the covers for the first two books called me up one day and said, you're not going to believe what's showing up on my canvas. It's all these sexy pears, like in fruit, pears. And I said, interesting you should say that because I've got all this sexy poetry that's sitting in a shoebox that I don't know what to do with. I said, send me your slides, I'm sending you my poetry. We did an exchange. She loved the poetry, I loved the pears. How did it feel to know that you were stepping out into the world with your work? In some ways it felt terrifying. I, could, I want to go back to an earlier story, way back when, when my son was sick and I got involved in healthy cooking. Now I'd grown up in the restaurant business, I'd studied at Cordon Bleu in Paris, I'd done all this stuff, I could cook. And I took this basic cooking course. And the woman who ran that course said to me, what are you doing here, you know too much. I explained I had a sick child, I'm making a very long story very short. And I cooked my way through her cookbook in 30 days. And then she said, now you're going to come teach for me. And I said, oh my god, no, there's no way. I, I can't stand up in front of people and do that. And she looked me straight in the eye and she said, the world's in too damn much trouble for you to make yourself small. You know too much and you need to share it. And I think that that has stayed with me. And that particular thing needs to be stated again, that the world is... is in too much trouble for any of us to make ourselves small. So you're not only doing your work, you are inspiring lots of other people to do their work as well. Always. I have a website called Authentic Woman, and it's about women finding their authentic voice, speaking from that place, making their choices from that place, going out in the world and doing what what they are called to do, what they're to offering their gifts and talents to the world. Because the world wants what we do best. That also takes me to my favorite page in your book, which is page 64, because in that page, on that page, you grapple with the troubles in the world, but you also talk about the importance of taking small steps, meaningful steps. I think we all begin always right where we are what's directly in front of us. Sometimes it's as simple as that. We just begin where we are. 
I think that too often because of how much we know about the great heroines or the Mother Teresas, it seems, well, I can't do that, so why should I do anything? Nothing matters. And I come from the place everything matters. Any time we reach out and serve matters. You mentioned in your book that you read somewhere that succumbing to dismay is a sin. Can you talk about that? It was in a prayer book. And the, there was a litany of sins of what was considered a sin. And I was finding myself distracted and disgruntled with it. Like, what, what is a sin? And then on that page was the sin of succumbing to dismay. And that one caught my eye because it's not about getting dismayed. We all get dismayed. If you turn on the, the news every morning, which I don't recommend doing, and you, you're bombarded with, with the who got hurt, shot, or whatever, it, it's too confrontive, immediately confrontive. So we all get dismayed. The idea is to not succumb. You see something, you recognize it, you touch that pain in whatever way you do, and then you do what there is to do, to not succumb, to find what there is within you to respond in whatever way you can. Speaking of that, artists historically have talked about, written about, painted about their own personal despair. How do you deal with despair for yourself? For me, because I'm a writer, and a ponderer, uh, soul searching. I think I've been soul searching ever since I can remember. So the first place for me is always to go inside. I generally journal. I journal a lot. I have boxes of old journals. And so I will begin there. That's the first place. I'll begin to write. And I write in the sense of not trying to create an essay, but to empty what's full to allow it to fall onto the page so that it's not hidden, so that I can discover it, I can see it, just by having it there. And then, so years ago, what I discovered is, in doing that, it was a great process, but if somebody were to look at my journals, they would think I was one miserable human being because all I'd, I would dump what was terrible. And I thought, well, I'm giving a whole lot of power in this book to what's terrible, and I but nothing, because you might not see an entry for four months because I'm in a great place so I'm not writing. So I began to think I need to do this in a more balanced way. And one of the things that I do now, I have, I have an agreement with my journal that no matter how dismayed I am, no, no matter how sad I am, I never leave my journal until I can find one, one step I can take that's positive. One, one small step, it could be call a friend, it could be take a nap, it could be go for a walk, it could be write something. Whatever it is, it's one step to begin the journey from, from that bottom place back, back up again. I think the other thing that I, that I do, relationship is my highest value. I've done a lot of work on values, on what, what my values are. And so I always, I put in place a support system. So for when things, this year in particular, was, was a very tough year. And what I did is I called a number of friends, very dear friends, and asked them to once a week meet me on the phone to remind me who I am. Literally, to just remind me who I am. When I'm swirling around in this story and the fear comes up, I want to be able to talk with somebody who can see that other part of me. And so what we do is something, it's really the gift of a question. I will say to them, what's alive in you? They will say to me, what's alive in you? And when asked that question, then I just speak. There's no interruption. There's no back and forth conversation. It's an opportunity for me to process and then for them to process. It's the most powerful thing that I know how to do. And it clears. And you also bring this to your coaching practice. Yes. Always. Coaching is a process of inquiry, so it's asking questions. And I know I'm doing a good job when someone goes, ooh, that's a great question. 